Welcome everyone. I'm Lisa Olson with the Newberry Library. Thank you for joining us for today's program, Experimental Jazz from the Chicago Renaissance to the Present, featuring Terry Lynn Carrington and Nicole Mitchell in conversation with Romy Crawford. We're grateful to the Paul M. Angel Fam uh, Family Foundation for sponsoring today's program. The Newberry Library supports and inspires research, teaching, and learning in the humanities. Since our founding in 1887, the Newberry has remained dedicated to deepening our collective understanding of ourselves and the world around us. We connect researchers and visitors with our collection in the Newberry's reading rooms, exhibition galleries, program spaces, classrooms, and online digital resources. You can visit our website, newberry.org, to make an appointment to do research in our reading rooms, or you can stop by the library without an appointment Tuesday through Saturday to visit our exhibition halls. Our bookshop is open Wednesday through Saturday. Also visit our website to learn about our current exhibition and public program series, Viva la Libertad, about the age of revolutions across the Americas in the late 18th and early 19th century. The exhibition will be open through July 24th. Today's program is one example of the Newberry Library's civic commitment to public education and intellectual engagement. Bringing together communities of scholars, students, artists, and performers to, dis to, to discuss ideas that matter in our world today is central to the Newberry's mission. Now today is a special day. Uh, every June 21st is Make Music Chicago, an initiative organized by the International Music Foundation that brings together Chicagoans to celebrate their ability to make music, regardless of age, ability, or musical style. We've partnered with Chicago-based nonprofit Experimental Sound Studio, which is dedicated to artistic evolution and the creative exploration of sound. An international hub for sonic experimentation, ESS nurtures artists, helps bring into being new works, and aims to build a broad, supportive community of makers, enthusiasts, and creative partners. So I think um, there should be a link to ESS in the chat, or it's being posted right now. I hope you'll check out their website. Um, and welcome to those of you who are watching through the ESS stream on YouTube. Now, during today's program, you can enter questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments section if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Romy Crawford, and then she is going to introduce today's performers. Romy Crawford, and hopefully she'll come on board now. Romy Crawford is professor in the Visual and Critical Studies and Liberal Arts Department at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. There she is. Her research and courses explore areas of race and ethnicity as they relate to American visual culture, including art, film, and photography. She is co-author of a really great book called The Wall of Respect, Public Art and Black Liberation in 1960s Chicago, among many other works, and was previously curator and director of the education department at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, so I'm gonna turn things over to Romy. I'll probably um, pop back in at the end to help us um, field some questions from those of you joining us today. So Romy, I'll hand things over to you. Great. Thank you, Liesl. Um, and I would like to introduce um, Terry Lynn Carrington and Nicole Mitchell. And so I'll start with Terry Lynn. Terry Lynn Car Carrington is a multiple Grammy award-winning drummer, producer, and educator who is recorded and toured with Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter, Pharaoh Sanders, Diane Reeves, David Murray, John Schofield, Deanna Krall, Lester Bowie, Cassandra Wilson, and countless other jazz luminaries. Carrington made history as the first woman to win a Grammy Award in the Best Jazz Instrumental Album category for Money Jungle, uh, Provocative in Blue, a reimagining of the Duke Ellington classic. Her collaborations with Esperanza Spalding and Jerry Allen, as well as her female-driven mosaic project recordings have received critical acclaim. She is the founder and artistic director of the Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice at Berklee College of Music. She also serves as the artistic director for the Berkeley, uh, for Berkeley's Summer Jazz Workshop and as artistic director of the Carr Center in Detroit. Terry Lynn holds honorary doctorates from Berkeley College and the Manhattan School of Music. And also Nicole Mitchell is with us. Thanks, 
Terry Lynn for being here. Uh, Nicole Mitchell is a creative flautist, um, composer, band leader, and also educator who developed her music in Chicago's resilient arts community. She is a United States artist, uh, 2020, um, a du Doris Duke artist from 2012, a Herb Alpert Award uh, not, a recipient from 2011. Nicole is the founder of the Black Earth Ensemble and is former president of Chicago's Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, the AACM. As a composer, she has been commissioned by the French Ministry of Culture, the Museum of Contemporary Art, the Newport Jazz Festival, the Art Institute of Chicago, the French American Jazz Exchange, Chamber Music America, Music Now, the Chicago Jazz Festival, International Contemporary uh, Ensemble, um, ICE, and the Chicago Sinfonietta. She holds the William S. Dietrich II um, Endowed Chair in Jazz Studies and is the Director of Jazz Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so Nicole, thank you also for being here. And I should say that um, to both of you, you know, uh, Nicole, I mean, um, uh, Liesl Olson, um, many, many months ago, um, asked me if I would put together a program for, for this music season and this music um, uh, day uh, that, that the Newberry uh, hosts. And, um, and I really wanted to have the two of you uh, in the room um, with me to discuss uh, really because of the breadth and span of your practices, right? And the fact that you both work so multidisciplinarily um, and that you both, you both are, are interested in and committed to, um, you know, a, a gendered perspective as you educate and as you make work. And so I, those are, you know, some of the, the, the ways that I'd love to engage you all in a conversation today because there, there aren't many people um, uh, who, who do this the way that, that you all do it. Um, so, so one of the, the ways I wanted to start our discussion um, has to do with archives and legacy and lineage. It's one of the things I think about a lot and write about a lot. Um, you know, I think a lot and write about the histories of Chicago, um, uh, Chicago music histories and uh, um, uh, artistic history and visual history and, and then the histories that come out of the, uh, the Black, Black Chicago, um, including the AACM, et cetera. And so I wanted to, to start with a question that was about legacy and inheritance and the archive. Um, and, and by asking you all to, to, to address how you negotiate um, the jazz legacy, the you know the, the very tremendous uh, and vast and impressive archive of, of, of jazz making, and then also uh, you know how you negotiate that and your pathway as women in this predominantly you know uh, for the most part to predominantly male genre. So how are you, you know, sort of dancing between that past um, and a type of future that you can can live in and inhabit? that has a different um, provocation, especially around, around gender. I don't know who should go first. <laughs> yeah, who wants to go? I mean, I, I can't, I mean, it's complicated, you know, the history, there's a part of me, I have a cold, so I'm congested, but, um, it's, it's complicated. And um, I think what happens in the beginning, I think, is you just fall in love with the music and you're not thinking about these things. Um, most, most people have, you know, if you're lucky, I guess, if you have that luxury. Um, I know that's what happened with, with me. And it took uh, quite a bit of time for me to start to pay more attention to mm -hmm. um, how I how, how I fit in and how I you know, feel that um, you know the space that was there for me the space that um, wasn't there for me the space that I can help to create for others um, because you know I think a lot of us are you know can be conflicted with the legacy um, mm -hmm. but the first thing is you know for me is the richness of the legacy and how important it is and um, uh, how it's just, you know, the, the problems with it are, are just um, a byproduct of, of the problems of society. So when I think about it like that, I don't, you know, get as angry, you know, or, or I don't point fingers. Um, I just start trying to um, work on 
whatever way I can contribute to solutions in regard to gender. And for anybody that is not familiar with it, um, it's extremely male dominated, has been forever. And the narrative has always been that the men play the music, the women sing it. And then of course you had some exceptions with women pianists mostly. Um, so when I came around in the seventies um, playing drums, it was very, very different. But I think you know the problem then becomes how do you fit in? And often it is um, simulating, you know, whatever it is that you're seeing. So um, yeah, I was basically trying to be one of the guys, right. and it took me a long time to realize that I should I should be able to really be my authentic self, and um, you know, I don't have to replicate any of uh, you know these systemic issues. I don't have to replicate um, sexism the way that I was seeing it. Or mm -hmm. I don't have to ignore it either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are just things, you know, for me, as far as dealing with that legacy um, and also, you know, loving the music and all of the, the beauty in that legacy and trying to just help to create space. So I'll just jump in, Terry Lynn in agreement that I think it just starts with love and being excited about the possibilities. I know for me, I came in really late. Like, I feel like I'm a real late bloomer. So I wasn't even playing the music until I was in my twenties. And I didn't really realize I had a space that I could be in. I mean, I listened to the music, but it took a while for it to click to realize, oh, this is something I can do. <laughs> so I was playing, you know, the instrument, I was playing the flute and the flute is not a popular instrument in jazz. Mm -hmm. So it's already, you're coming kind of in the margin as, as a flute player. And, you know, there's Hubert Laws, there's James Newton, you know, there's some great flute players before me that, you know, had really made their way doing, doing that, uh, but it was, it was definitely a process of, of like um, accepting myself, you know, that this is something that I could do and realizing that it was an amazing opportunity to really be myself, you know, to really uh, express my full self, like as an improviser where, it wasn't something that was necessarily an invitation to it, but, but like when I, you know, I remember the moment I was like, I was, I think 20 at 75th at the apartment lounge, new apartment lounge, Von Freeman was playing mm -hmm. and we weren't supposed to be in there underage, but I was like, oh my God, this is what I want to do, <laughs> you know, um, in Chicago. So, uh, it took some years and some struggles to make that happen. But I always felt also, I think you have to be compelled, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you have to be compelled because obviously there's no promises with any of this. And it has to be something that, you know, is really driving you. And for me, I really felt from the beginning, there was something different that I could bring, something new I could bring. And that actually made it a little problematic because, you know, when you're first starting out, you have teachers that say, no, you need to do it like this. You need to do it how it's been done. And from the beginning, I was very rebellious. And, and I spent actually a lot of time playing on the street and trying to animate and illustrate like people walking by musically through improvisation. And so I was, <laughs> I was doing a lot of, a lot of soul searching and, you know, like a real free spirit. So um, that was how I came into it. And luckily I had some great mentors, you know, Donald Byrd and um, Jimmy Cheatham were my first two teachers Jimmy Cheatham um, play with Count Basie. And so I think I didn't think about the woman thing so much because I was too busy being a flute player and being an outsider because of that. And then once you really start doing something, nobody's going to call you. 
<laughs> to be a side person on the flute, you know. So I I had to start creating my own spaces from the beginning in order to engage, you know, because it wasn't like people were inviting me necessarily to get that mentorship. I had to kind of create for my for myself. Um, and then once I did that, then everybody's asking me to play, but because I had already established something. So the gender thing was really about gaining the confidence. And I started really, I put seven years into an all women group in the beginning, like in, in Chicago, when I first moved to Chicago, Samana, which is the first all women band in the ACM. And that helped me to gain confidence to be a band leader. I wasn't quite ready for that. It took a minute. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's definitely everybody has their own journey for sure. And and the legacy is very vast. And I found myself, people would, you know, hire me clubs or hire me and say, oh, you know, we need you to do these standards. And I'll say, yeah, okay, I'll do my own standards. And I would write something in the spirit of Mingus, in the spirit of Ellington, in the spirit of, you know, of, of these great composers. But um, that was a lot of fun to find a way to connect to their approach in the music through writing my own. And that mm-hmm. was kind of how I started with that. Yeah, I love that in, in both of those stories, are, you know, there's there's that um, connecting to the legacy of the tradition through these projects, which are about, as, as Nicole said, in the spirit of, because you did some of that too, Terry Lynn, without calling it that, you know, just how, do you, how, how to pay homage, but, um, but to riff on that a little bit and to, um, to, to create your, and produce your own interventions in something that's an homage to, you know, a great jazz legend or something. Um, really interesting. What about the relationship that you both, you both also mentioned you kind of your love, you know, you started, you know, as many of us do with whatever it is that we do with sort of a passion or love for the, for that object. Um, And, you know, was your love for the music connected to your love for the instrument? So just something about the instruments, you know, the drums and the flute um, respectively. And was there, you know, did you find that that the the, the instruments also were were in, you know gender encoded in some way? Was there any problematic with the instrument itself and your grappling with it as 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 women practitioners? Um, that uh, that was e- either an opportunity for innovation or an impediment. So in that object itself, the instrument, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say so. I mean, I think they're both uh, definitely coded instruments. Um, and I mean, to some degree, you know, I mean, for, for the drums, I, there just weren't very many women. I didn't have any women role models, really. I mean, I think I barely saw any women playing the drums at all uh, for many, many, many years. Um, but Yes, I do think it was an opportunity. Uh, it was an opportunity because a lot of people, I think, wanted that. Though sometimes it may f- it may have felt like a gimmick in some ways to some people. Mm-hmm. But if you're serious and you play well, it's it's soon not a gimmick. It's only a gimmick, I think, if you if you're not serious and you don't play well, and it's all about something else. But um, so anybody that maybe came to me with that idea soon, hopefully, I, I believe, soon changed their mind, you know? Yeah. So I think that, w- that was an opportunity too, to, to, to make it serious for women to be able to, uh, to play that instrument and to bring, uh, eventually to, to figure out that it is possible uh, to bring a different aesthetic to the instrument. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I had to be able to play just as loud, just as fast, just as you know, strong as the next guy. But then eventually, I think I felt uh, more connected to a certain kind of, uh, I don't know, seductive quality of the instrument. You know, like I, there was, there was I, I used to call it seductive aggression because there would be this, you know, aggression, but it wasn't in the same way that I was hearing it. Uh, from some of uh, my male 
peers. And I, I could never over, I mean, I could overplay, but I could never step all over people. I could never just plow through. I had to really go against who I was to do that. And sometimes I had to do it just because I had to demand a certain kind of respect from others, but it was really totally against my nature. And then eventually I became comfortable with that. So, and if people thought that, you know, I wasn't whatever, you know, hard enough, strong enough at any given moment, um, I was I'm laughing because um, it's a choice, you know, and um, I mean, I don't mind saying, saying it. I remember because it was public. David Murray actually said something like that in an article because we did a project together. And he said that how, you know, he enjoyed playing with me and Jerry, but he said that, you know, basically he said, I didn't hit as hard as, as the dudes, but I was cleaner, more precise. That's the word he said. I was more precise. <laughs> and so like, I texted him immediately. <laughs> you know, I was like, you know, that, that, that's a choice, you know, right. I, I, you know I, I can't do that if, you know, but, you know, so anyway, I, I realized that, uh, that aesthetic is very important to some people on the drums and, um, and it's important, you know, when I'm teaching students, I mean, I, I want my, my, I think you should play the whole range of the instrument. You should understand the history of the instrument. There's a certain ferocious nature to the instrument that I think is important for uh, women to hone in on, just as I feel like there's a certain sensitive nature and, um, you know, beautiful nature to the instrument that I wish some more of my male students would hone in on. So, I mean, you know, and I'm not trying to be stereotypical, but I'm just saying you have to play all of the, the range and, you know, all of the qualities of, of the instrument. And, I, and I, that's my hope that most people, you know, look at it like that. And it's, it's really not about gender, but it's about a lot of possibilities. But if there were more women as markers or, you know, like, you know, as people that people looked up to, to play mm -hmm. like, you know that uh, that would be inspiring the younger generation i think that naturally then would bring out more of those qualities so that's my hope that a jazz future is more equi equitable so that this talk about gender is something that we don't even have to discuss because everybody's influencing each other and right. um you know the music is moving forward in a different way and the potential of the music is is different because of it yeah, that's such a key point, uh, Terry Lynn. I, I of course, um, you know, was privy to some of this at your the amazing uh, conference a few weeks ago, and I'll bring it up later. That that took place through the um, through the Institute uh, for Jazz and Gender Justice a couple of weeks ago. Um, but but this I, I I love that that you mentioned seductive aggression as being a, a type of idea that actually comes out of. Um, your uh, encounter with the drums and and that idea, as I think I you know you know is so much bigger than just the the issue of your being a woman playing the drums. So the the gender uh, uh, idea or gender issue is just a kind of starting point for much bigger ideas that can come from from our being involved in, in these and uh, kind of connected to these instruments. So um, it's a really provocative idea and so. You know, Nicole, is there an idea that's comparable to that? You know, not comparable, but but a, a similarly potent idea that comes out of your relationship to playing the flute? Definitely. I found that a lot of dudes would play flute. They, you know, it's like a second instrument to the saxophone and, and they use it for quote unquote color. Like, mm -hmm. oh, let's play something sweet and pretty right now. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, no, let's make it dirty and... <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, I look at it as exploring or reaching for the edge of beauty. That's the concept, which is the fact of, first of all, you always hear critics saying, oh, the flute is just not that expressive. It doesn't really compare mm -hmm. in range emotionally to the saxophone and the brass. And, you know, I'm like, yes, it can. You can, you can express all of these different things on the flute so that was really a mission for me to to show and that wasn't so much being again being like because of I'm a woman but more just battling the stereotype of the instrument and and being like look like the flute can do 
a lot of different things that people just might not be interested in doing. Like you don't just have to have one color all the time of how you express, Mm -hmm. you know, you can put grit into it. You can add your voice, you know, you can do a lot of different things, bending notes, you know, that to make it expressive. So that was something that was really important to me. Um, So even though, of course, the most famous flute players are men, (laughs) Uh-huh. You know, so even though people assume, oh, it's a woman's instrument, but no, all the quote unquote most famous best music, best flute players have been men for the most part. So there still is that challenge of of that. Um, for me, definitely drawing into the music, being drawn into it was just so. I was just so attracted to the idea of connecting to this community of musicians and like working out problems together and experimenting and and kind of making new worlds like through the music and the flute is just one part of that, you know. Mm-hmm. So I mean there was the the compositional desires that went with that and um but the flute being my primary voice you know, of, you know, kind of my identity is definitely wrapped up in it. And it's taken me to a lot of places where I've had to grow, you know, as a person through playing the instrument, you know, Mm -hmm. or through being in the music, Mm -hmm. you know, like talking with you all, like I was a really shy person. I would not (laughs) have been comfortable doing this, you know, 20 years ago, but you know, it's like the music will push you you know. Right. Right. Yeah. And, it, and of course, your your flute playing, you know, uh, does push the the limits um, of, of the instrument, it seems to me. Um, and I also love that, that you describe this in terms of a voice, Nicole, because that's actually one of the ways I, I kind of framed your your piece in Fleeting Monuments. Um, the, the book was around this writer, right? Your writing being a kind of another compelling voice. And again, your your music, you um, your, your flute playing gets really close to some sort of other 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 range, <laughs> range outside of the instrument. Um, so, but this makes me me think also that one of the the common uh, the another sort of common ground for you uh, between you both is is um, multidisciplinarity or sort of uh, some sort of interest in in. Um, in, 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 in forms that, that are kind of, again, pushing the, the, the limits of, of what they can do. And so, you know, Terry Lynn, I know that you've worked with visual artists such as Carrie Mae Weems, and I think also McLean, you work with McLean and Thomas. And, and, right, and Nicole, you, you know, you, you're involved in these, these kind of uh, multidisciplinary practices. So I'm just wondering if you all could, could address, you know, how, how that uh, relates to the, the practice at large and whether or not that is uh, something that, that um, you know, you, what, what does that co- impulse come from? The impulse to, to work with other makers and, and, and uh, artists who, who work in, in other forms and formats. Um, where does the impulse come from? I, uh, I don't know. I think that's just the creative force, you know, the creative mm-hmm. energy, the impulse is, what none of us knows as far as I, I can see. You know what I mean? That's like, that's the spark. Yeah, right. You know, that impulse is the magic that we can't put our fingers on because if we could, then we'd be able to tell other people how to find, you know, that spark, that impulse, that, mm-hmm. that creative energy. Um, but I, I think, think- about collaboration. Partially, Maybe. yeah. It, yeah, and partially it's, it's about um, expanding yourself, I think. Um, I think, you know, we're artists and, you know, I think we're artists first. So for me, it's not about the drums. It -hmm. just happens to be the way that I express myself Mm -hmm. the most. And also through writing, um, writing music, but also writing words. Um, It's, I get the same feeling, you know, if I write a lyric that I do when I play is, I mean, it's, or, or, or write music or, um, just whatever then you know or cook you know like cook a good meal you know it's funny I mean I want the same um you know whatever attraction we have and in, in playing to having uh, people uh, applaud you I'm not saying we do it for that reason but that feeling of we all feel a little funny right if we play a gig and nobody applauds I mean 
so there's something there about uh, there's an exchange there. And um, I realized when I cook, you know, it's the same thing. You know, I want I want that exchange of the dialogue about it. I want people to, you know, respond somehow. Either they liked it or they didn't, or they thought they could have, you know, done better. I don't know. But um, mm-hmm. so I think it's all creative energy. And um, so for me, I just keep trying to expand. Mm-hmm. And um, recently, uh, you know, I've been thinking much more about uh, multidisciplinary um, expansion for myself and wanting to collaborate. And just, I'm having a lot of fun, you know, with figuring out ways to collaborate with other people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've just been talking to Nicole about collaborating on a piece that would involve us um, writing a piece together and, and filming it and, and involving some other visual artists. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, you know, that stuff is very exciting to me. So if somebody just calls me to do a gig playing the drums, I mean, that's cool, but it, it, it's, it's kind of not as exciting right now, right, you know, right. as yeah. these other things, because they're, they're expanding me. And I yeah. think you have to, you know, if you're that type of person, that's what's, what's going to float your boat, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. like that. And that's the thing about jazz too. I think it's, it's always about expanding and, uh, you know, the, the continuum of it all. Mm-hmm. Um, so most of my favorite artists, uh, players even, um, are people that are constantly expanding themselves in this way right. and interested in, in, in collaborations. Right. Right. And of course, the, you know, it, it's a perfect segue into a discussion of improvisation because, you know, in, in all of that collaboration is the... Um, the, the, the opportunity to, to improvisate. Um, and, and so, you know, what, what is the, how does, you know, this also I think speaks to how the ethos of improvisation is, is there underlying your, your practices um, in many ways. Um, and of course, it even relates to, to the, 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 the wonderful, I think, uh, piece that we're gonna see a little bit later that, that is sort of this amazing example of um, improvisating in a, in a period and moment when we're all improvisating a little bit in terms of how to get through so many of these uh, things that we have to get through. And so there's a, a piece that we're gonna, gonna show in a bit because I wanna have, be able to have time to talk about it on the other side where, where you all have, a, have figured out a way to produce a piece, a, a piece, a piece um, where you collaborate together even through Zoom, yeah. Um, so, so again, this therein is the example of how significant collaboration is, but I also think that in collaboration and setting your, up an opportunity to collaborate, you're kind of forced into, um, uh, you know, having to improvise a, a bit differently. Um, so um, I want to show that or, or listen to that in a few minutes, show and listen to it in a few minutes, but I wanted to, to uh, first ask a question just to make sure we have time for it um, about the, the educative piece that, that both of you all also care about. You are both uh, uh, faculty, you teach, you are um, kind of pushing some of, of, of what you know uh, forward. Uh, for a next generation. And of course, you know, Terry Lynn, I really want you to say something about the Institute because it is it is really sort of radical and amazing to me. And it's um, imagining of what what is one of the, the key lines uh, phrases I don't one of the mottos of, of your Institute for Jazz and Gender Justice to imagine uh, jazz in a world without in a culture. Patriarchy. Without patriarchy. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, basically uh, jazz without patriarchy. Yeah, jazz but it's, it's a, you know, imagine it, I think, um, on a stage without bias in, in a world without patriarchy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really what we're all trying to imagine. It's, I, I, you know, it's interesting that people uh, were, were so attracted to that phrase because it seems really, you know, plain and simple to me. Like, it, it's not um, rocket science, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's just what it, it's just kind of what it should be. And I think we're all, you know, working toward that. And these days are very exciting to me because I feel that it's becoming um, just you know, needed to be talked about a little mm-hmm. more. Mm-hmm. And it's becoming, uh, you know, more, uh, more the standard that people are expecting. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's not like it's not there yet. Don't get me wrong. But um, 
I'm, I'm excited because I, I feel I feel things you know shifting and it just feels like that's what's normal mm-hmm. this other way doesn't seem normal at all I mean whatever normal is it yeah. feels antiquated it feels obsolete you know it, it feels ancient you know? yeah it feels flat or something I always use the word of flatness it just feels flat in this in this moment I think it stands out so much because um uh, you know, for, for a lot of people, definitely not for everyone, you know, there's not uh, the sense that, that, that art making of any sort can, can change the world. And part of what's incredible about that provocation and that prompt is that you're saying it's not just about listening to something wonderful, <laughs> um, but, but about more, that the, the music can, can shift our perspective and, and how we see and view, view the world. And it has such, such a great potential. And so I think that is where people are sort of shocked that you put that out there in such clear terms. Um, so anyway, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, I, I mean, I look to people like Nicole because yeah, I exactly. think, um, you know, she just spoke about world making and, I think that that's, um, you know, really something that you've been doing, Nicole, for a long time and thinking about it in those terms. For me, uh, you know, I was kind of just kind of going along with the program for a long time. So, um, you know, Nicole and and some others are very inspiring in that way, especially when you start thinking about futurism or Afrofuturism and and those things, because... um, it's all the same uh, feeling, the same energy. Like I've been thinking more about uh, abolition and uh, was involved with the project uh, where I curated some videos uh, for UCSC uh, for their visualizing abolition um, distributed symposium. And I, and I asked Nicole to make one as well. <clears throat> and um, and I, I, I thought of Nicole quickly for that because um, of that ability to, um, to paint the future, you know, in, in music and in composition. So these ideas are all connected, um, and I'm a bit late to the party, so uh, <laughs> I just want to put that out there because I'm, I'm still learning, you know, as I go. Yeah, and I love that even that is something where you all are learning from each other. So that you're 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 learning from Nicole about some of this um, the potential of, of how um, how this 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 institute can can transform uh, the music, but also something bigger. Um, I think we went. Let's let's play the the piece, and it's called Mindscape. So Elizabeth, if you would um, play what is what is basically an original. You all correct me if I'm right, um, if I'm wrong, a, an original piece by Terry Lynn Carrington and uh, Nicole Mitchell. Thank you. 
Amazing, thank you. Thank you both, it's really wonderful. So it's called Mindscape, right? I didn't have the title um, before it showed. So, so called Mindscape in 2021. Can you tell us more about, about the piece? I imagine that it was um, spurred in some ways by, by the prompt of our conversation, but I'm not sure. Um, so, so just give us a little bit, bit of a background uh, as to how you went about producing and, and conceiving this. Yeah, it was definitely created for you all. Yeah. <laughs> and Terry Lynn started off. I mean, we did a round robin with it. She she laid down a whole atmosphere and improvised her drums. So the sampling or the electronic sounds are both of us. Mm -hmm. um, she had some electronics and then I added some sampling and electronics. And so drum is, I guess you could say, four instruments between us or two each. But it was definitely an exploration, uh, reaching towards telepathy. That's how I looked at it. Yeah, the mindscape part of it. Does experimentation on something like this, does it, will this work as a sketch of sorts for the future collaboration that you spoke about, Terry Lynn and, and Nicole, so if you all work on something in the future, do you use something like this as a sketch or, or not? That's, that's funny you mentioned that because as I was listening to it just now, um, I thought about that. And I think Nicole mentioned it before we did it, um, that maybe, you know, we could use it um, as a launching pad yeah. uh, for what we're gonna do in the future. Um, mm -hmm. It was, a, I guess, no, well, it was the first time we collaborated in this way. Um, we, we did a, a piece of the coals together uh, remotely or however we're calling this world yeah. we're in now. No. But we did a piece of Jerry, uh, that she wrote for Jerry Allen uh, this way. But this is the first time, um, you know, we collaborated in this way. And um, I was listening to different things that uh, were there and thought, yeah, this could be very cool as a launching pad for the piece that we're going to create, taking you know little snippets and ideas um, from it and expanding them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was paying attention to the as as I I do to some of the visual cues. Um, um, really, really kind of interesting. Some things that were you know seemed like they were leaning towards something you know futuristic, and then then other sort of very. Um, you know, kind of organic elements, the plant and all. And so there was, it's an opportunity to, not that you all don't do this all the time, but an opportunity to also think about the, the visual landscape of, of, of what you're doing. And again, I imagine you do that a lot, but again, this kind of, you know, uh, forced uh, video <laughs> taping of things. 
creates that as you know that that's another layer, another opportunity uh, layered onto the to the work and the practice. It seems. Have you have you had forays into that in the past? The video and filmic parts of it. I've I've done a few things. I'm definitely a secret wannabe filmmaker, <laughs> but I you know I'm still very much a beginner. Yeah. But I'm really interested and it's really fun to me. Um, mm -hmm. This one was probably the least experimental one I ever did. Okay. <laughs> you know, because of the timeline, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I do really enjoy playing around with it. And and I like, for some reason, I like documentarianism with mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I've been doing a little bit of that. But nothing like that would make me call myself a filmmaker but I do enjoy I do enjoy it and I'm really interested in experimental video mm -hmm. and I've collaborated with people that do that that really do it and give right. them ideas and try to you know with collaborating on my projects with them doing the video and stuff like that mm -hmm. but I would like to get to a place where I can do that on my own yeah of course I was listening for which is you know the the magic of this conversation in the last hour for me, um, one of the, the bits of magic, but was was around like listening for um, seductive aggression and the dirty flute. <laughs> I'm just gonna be, I'm just gonna be doing that all the time now. <laughs> and I hear what you all are up to, but I think those are just such provocative, amazing ideas. And it is, it is the part that just you know is absolutely exciting to me about what you do. That there are these important aesthetic cues and, and, and again, what I think of as knowledge formations that are embedded in the practice and just to have the opportunity to talk through some of that with you and to, to, to sort of parse out more of that, you know, in the future is, is um, super exciting. So. Uh, I have to say, I was listening for the dirty flute too. Yeah, the dirty flute. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Oh my goodness. It's, it's just, it's fantastic. So, yeah. Um, I think we're meant to spend, a, uh, to take a little time towards the end here to see if there are questions from an audience that we cannot see. Um, so, so, yeah, so let's do that. Uh, so I'll pop back in. Everyone, Liesl Olson from the Newberry. You all are awesome. It's so amazing to hear you talk and hear you perform. Uh, yeah, seductive aggression, the dirty flute, but you know, I'll take jazz without patriarchy anytime. Bring it on. Um, let that flourish um, between the two of you and the many, uh, many people who um, who you're inspiring. Um, it's just, it's awesome. It's really awesome. And thank you for creating something for today, something new for today that hopefully we'll see and um, even, uh, you know, um, uh, in the future, um, as you take it as the, 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 you know, for onward for further collaboration. Um, there are a few questions, definitely. And for those of you listening, uh, tuning in, uh, viewing, um, you can pose more questions in the Q&A or in the chat. I just am going to take a prerogative to return to Romy's first question about Chicago and about, um, you know, legacy. What do you all, what do you, uh, um, Terry Lynn and Nicole, think of when, when you think about Chicago? You both have roots, or not roots, but you've touched down in Chicago in really significant ways. What do you hear or think about when you think about Chicago music? Well, I can jump in. Um, my mother was from the South Side, so I spent a lot of time as a child in Chicago and as a young adult, it was always my dream to move there. So, you know, I moved there at 22 and spent more time there than anywhere else so far. And what I think about is the amazing legacy of Black experimentalism, like how it's a really strong, like somehow um, the Black arts movement really, uh, because there's such a great, wonderful, creative population there that there's just there's just this like no big deal about it. That's what I love about it, that it's not like this important, serious thing, but it's like people do it and it 
And they're like, yes, yeah, so-and-so is doing that over there. And there's not this expectation to be in the box, you know, to really, to really find your own voice. And, and, and it's like a legacy of that, which is really amazing. And the ACM has a lot to do with that. And also Sun Ra has something to do with that because he, Sun Ra, when he, you know, when he was, he moved from Birmingham to Chicago, that is when he really started out his ideas of the myth science orchestra. And, you know, so he did a lot of research, you know, he had a research group, an African research group that he put together and, um, explored like comedic ideas and and you know so that's this just been a long legacy of that for you know and and you know obviously I'm sure like King Oliver, Louis Armstrong, Lil Hard and Armstrong. I mean there was you know a lot of great music happening even in the 20s, even before that, you know, but and that can be looked at as experimentalism as well for the time that it was in you know, in a sense, we don't look at it that way now, but it was really innovative, you know, and so, yeah. yeah, so that innovation is something that is really special that uh, I haven't really found at in that way anywhere else. Right, right. And there's another question. Have either of you been influenced by Sun Ra, either musically or philosophically? So specific, you know, question about Sun Ra there, which I think you um, you answered, Nicole. Terry Lynn, what do you think about or hear when you, you know, when when you hear Chicago? Yeah, you know, I think I've always thought about freedom when I hear, you know, some music and musicians from Chicago is a different kind of freedom uh, musically, which meant, you know, other areas other than music as well. Um, and from I'm from Boston, so uh you know, it's, just, it's interesting how regions really do have a sound and make a difference. And um, I have to say, when I was younger, all of my trips to Chicago, uh, it was so cold that I didn't, I just thought, I don't like this place. You know, I don't like the city. I don't like coming here. <laughs> and parts of it reminded me of Boston. And I was trying to get away from Boston, <laughs> you know. Um, and then uh, I, 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 uh, my close friend, I have a close friend that lives in Chicago and uh, she has a school. Uh, her name is Monica Haslip and uh, I joined the board of her school, Little, uh, Little Black Pearl uh, Academy, Art and Design Academy. It is now, before it was Little Black Pearl Workshop, like uh, over 20 years ago. But anyway, uh, so I started coming more often and getting involved in um, doing you know, fun, fundraising events and um, just music events um, uh, that places on the South side. And then I started understanding a different uh, cultural richness um, in the city and it became one of my favorite places to go. And I just was, uh, you know, just so happy that my experience with the city changed so drastically. Um, but also while I was in um, living in New York, um, like 1984 to 89, uh, Lester Bowie was a big mentor of mine. So a lot of the, uh, you know, stories from him, um, uh, you know, playing with people like him and I mean, Claudine Myers and uh, Chico Freeman and just different people over the years. Uh, I, I started really associating this kind of experimentalism and, and freedom that I longed for because I think the biggest Education for me, one of the biggest moments of education for me was when I was about 19 or 20 and I played a week at the Vanguard with Lester Bowie and realized how incredibly um, unprepared, you know, ill fit I was to play with him at the time, you know, and um, because I, I just didn't have that in me, uh, the ability to, uh, you know, just to be as creative in that way, you know. Um, I, I needed more, I needed more, you know, grounding or more, uh, I couldn't be groundless. And that's something that, um, I'm so enjoying right now in my life, you know, so it's funny. I so wish that he were alive <laughs> so I could, um, you know, play with him now. 
That's a really striking story. Yeah, I love what you're saying about Chicago and how it correlates in some way with freedom or experiment. And one of the things I write about Chicago, mostly it's artists and writers, but I think a lot about uh, women in the city and where they find their freedom and how they, uh, how they take the risks to make experiments um, in, in the arts. And so you are both uh, really extraordinary models for that. Uh, there's, a, there's a question about whether you have any plans to perform in Chicago anytime soon. Um, and this um, viewer says, Nicole, thanks for the recent great Artifacts Trio show at Constellation. So uh, are, you, are either of you coming through Chicago anytime soon? We just hosted an ACM event um, Saturday at Experimental Sound Studio. Yeah. And then the ACM new, newest members did solo duos and a quartet. Um, awesome. I, I don't have anything coming up, but I would love people, if they're in California, to come to the Afrofuturism exhibit at Oakland Museum which will open in August 6th. I have a sound installation there that I'm really excited about and um, hope to get to Chicago soon, but well, maybe this will be the start. I don't have the date that, yet. That return, the return. There's another, um, there was another question or comment about, um, about the food metaphor that Terry Lynn, you were using cooking, right? And how so many of today's celebrity chefs um, are men when so much of the everyday cooking in life is produced, of course, by, by women um, and not just everyday cooking, but extraordinary uh, cooking <laughs> is done by women. So it was just a kind of comment about the, the, the ways in which that metaphor um, uh, really works and, so, you know, um, uh, in terms yeah, that's of patriarchy, right? Again. <laughs> I know, right. I mean, right, when you get right. paid a lot of money to cook, yeah, then, then it's, you right. know, you're a chef and, you know, it's the same thing with a, a seamstress and a tailor. Or, <laughs> right. You know, it's, it goes on and on. I mean, I think when we attack these um, systems, we're doing it, whatever um, field or whatever medium we're, we're, we're working in, I think we're, when we attack these systems, it's it's really global and it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's all the same. It's you know, everywhere. Some areas may be a little more evolved than others, but I think you have to, you know, uh, attack these things at the root and uh, really figure out how we change our society and start thinking differently. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're nearing the end of our time. Do either of you have a comment or question for one another? Yeah, Terry Lynn, um, don't you think having a gender balance ban is a lot of fun. Like, I just feel like there's so much more comedy. Like when, when you have a group that like has a, you know, have it has a balance of people, you know, where it's not all one or all the other, but it, everybody's just a mix of everybody. Um, like I try to do that as much as I can because it's just so much more fun. And I was just wondering what you, what your thoughts are. On oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've come to realize I don't really particularly care for one or the other um, right now, you know, the stage. Um, I know we both have done all female projects, but it's, that's, you know, that to me, when you do something that, like that, it's more corrective work. Um, but the world we live in is not that. So I, I love for the stage to represent the world we live in in some way. So, um, you know, I appreciate all kinds of balances, especially gender. Um, but, you know, I, I appreciate um, different ethnicities, um, different, um, just, you know, different ideas, different, you know, origins of ideas that, you know, come to, to the music. Sometimes always just a little different, you know, with people. And um, unless you're really looking for a homogenized kind of sound, <laughs> you know, um, and sometimes it's not that, you know, sometimes you are looking for a certain thing and it might, you know, require something different. But I do appreciate, you know, all kinds of balance because it makes you deal with um, your own ideas about other people. You know, it makes you, you know, deal with some people would say, I don't know, you know, 
tolerance or whatever words people like and to you use, can but, deepen friendships yeah yeah i mean i grow to love people you know through playing with them and through touring right. with them and through creating music writing songs with them i mean i um yeah it's back to what we were saying or what i was saying earlier about expansion mm-hmm. so when you have a stage as a platform right so you're able to to you know expand yourself on that platform and that and hopefully expand others yeah and it's like a microcosm that you can create your own society right there with the group <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you all so much. Another um, comment. Thank you, Romy, Terry Lynn, and Nicole. Your work, care, intellect, music, and power inspires me greatly. I appreciate each of you so much. And that's from Kate Dumbleton. I don't know if you know Kate. Oh, uh, Kate. Yeah. yeah, her Kate. gratitude. Um, so I think we um, need to, to end today's program. Um, I, I can't say thank you enough for coming together and to for performing a piece, a new piece. Um, really, really appreciate your vision. Um, and thank you also to the Angel Fa- Fa- Foundation for supporting today's program. So um, Romy and Terry Lynn and Nicole, thank you. And thanks, thanks to, to all Terry of you. Thank you, Terry Lynn Nicole, everyone. Thank you, Romy. Thank you you for joining us and all the people who tuned in. Um, Just to let you know that a recording of of this program will be available on the Newberry's YouTube channel in a few days. Um, Also might just note that this program, like all Newberry public programs, um, is free, was free, um, and open to the public. Um, And really that's thanks to the generosity of our donors. So if you have even a small inclination to give to the Newberry, please do, it's really easy. Just go to newberry.org slash give. And um, also in the chat, you'll see that you can join us for our next virtual program, which is on Tuesday, June 29th uh, at 5 p.m. And the title of our program is Re-Indigenizing Spaces and Juga Goinek, which is the um, Potomotomy word for Chicago, Re-Indigenizing Spaces and Juga Goinek with Doug Keel, Madeline Wiesa, and X. This discussion is part of the Chicago Monuments Project. Speakers will explore how public monuments relate to memory and history and how indigenous spaces and futures can be reclaimed through action and through art. Um, And you can register for that program on our website, newberry.org. So thank you all. Be well. Bye. See you later.